and it says, you have arrived, and I was way down there in somebody's front yard. <laughs> so I had to call the pastor and say, how do I find you? I should have said Gabriel's Creek Church Road. So it was, I can't blame it on the GPS this time. But it, it is good to be here. So I'm going to spend some time this morning just introducing myself and let you know who I am and, and sort of about what I did and then just add to it when the, when the regular service starts. I'm from South Carolina. You ever heard of Greer? Okay. I'm a, my address was route to Greer, but I was halfway between Greer and Landrum. You ever heard of Dark Corner? Okay, I'm a dark corner girl. So I tell people they didn't raise missionaries up there, they raised bootleggers. Yeah. And my brother was one of them. So that's, a, that's where I grew up. Grew up out in the country. And uh, the one least likely to go to the mission field. I think if you had, had decided this whole high school kids, which one would be the least likely to go to the mission field, I would have been chosen. And, uh, but you know, God put a desire in my heart to be a missionary when I was just a kid. I was saved when I was 11 years old, and I had never seen a missionary. Never seen a missionary. But my pastor's wife, she would give me books to read and stories, and all of them were about missionaries. So I read a lot of stories about, you know, Hudson Taylor and Mary Schlesser and all of these missionaries, and I thought I'm going to be just like that. And when I was 12 years old, I went forward in that church and told them that God was calling me to be a missionary and nobody took me serious. I know that because they told me later <laughs> that they did not take me serious. But the Lord put a desire in my heart. You can't believe, a desire, believe the desire that God put in my heart to be a missionary. I don't think there's ever been a missionary go to the field that was more excited about it than I was. I mean, I wanted to be a missionary. My father died when I was eight years old and there were six of us. We were the poorest kids in the whole community and nobody up there in Dark Corner had ever gone to college at that time. And I'm going around talking about going to, going to college. And my mama forbade me to talk about it. She said, I'll get you through high school and you're on your own. And believe me, she meant it. I graduated on Thursday. She moved me over into the big city of Greenville in the YWCA the next Thursday. And I was 17 years old. And I've been on my own ever since. But. Uh, I would pray and I would beg God, please let me be a missionary. If you'll just let me be a missionary, I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. I'll, I'll, I'll die for you. I found out later it's harder to live for the Lord than it is to die for him. But I said, I'll die for you. If you'll just let me be a missionary, please let me be a missionary. And I went off to GA camp. And uh, that's when I saw my very first missionary. She was an older, retired lady. She just looked like what I had seen in those books. She had the long print dress, the big old brogan look of shoes, her hair up in a bun, and she'd sit out in front of her cabin, and I'd sit down on the steps, and I would just look at her and think, I'm going to be just like that. I'm going to be just like that. <coughs> because I wanted so much to be a missionary. And uh, so I did. I, I got me a job and started school and worked my way through school. And, and got on that airplane, and I had never been on an airplane in my life, but I wanted on that airplane so bad. When you apply to a mission board, you're a candidate. This is where they categorize it. You're a candidate. Once you get accepted, you're an appointee. When you get on the airplane, you're a missionary. I know getting on an airplane doesn't turn anybody into a missionary, but I, was, I wanted on that airplane because then, according to the way the mission categorized it, I was a missionary, and I got on that airplane, I'm a missionary, I'm a missionary, I'm on the airplane, I'm a missionary. I was so excited, and I got to the field, and before I went to the field, people would come up to me and say, well, what are you planning to do? And that would irritate me, because I thought, I'm going to be a missionary. A missionary goes and tells people about Jesus, right? That's what I'm going to do. I know they meant you're going to be a secretary or a teacher or a bookkeeper or whatever. I'm going to go tell people about Jesus. That's what I'm going to do. I'm a missionary. And I got there and I was so excited I wanted to tell people about Jesus and I discovered I couldn't tell anybody anything because I didn't know their language. Not only that, I was sure they were making fun of me. When I learned the language, I found out they really had been making fun of me. <laughs> oh, yeah, here comes another one, one of those weirdos that stands around looking like an idiot, you know, and can't say anything. But I wanted to, I wanted to learn the language. I wanted to talk to the people so bad. And I started working at it. <clears throat> 
and I studied the Indonesian language first. And uh, after I studied the Indonesian language, which was sort of like the trade language, then I went to the tribe where I started out in the tribal language. But I was just, I was just so excited. Let me tell you about that first week on the field. I, could, I wanted to experience everything. If you can eat it, I'll eat it. I'm going to learn the language. I'm going to do it all. I'm going to do it all. I was wanted to be a missionary so bad. And I, my first house was a, what they called a king strand. When the missionaries first went there, way, way back in the 50s, they could put up these, this are called a, a, a sort of big heavy corrugated aluminum. And you could put that thing up in hardly no time. And they thought that would be a great thing to do. And they put the thing up and decided that you don't do that in the tropics. If you want to know what, house, what that house was like, turn your oven up to about 120 degrees and get in it, and you'll know. <laughs> so nobody had been living in that house. So they, uh, the, and the grass had been about, weeds and bushes and grass was up about that high, and they had cut it all down around the house. But they hadn't cleared the thing out of the rats and the other little critters running around in there. So that was going to be my first house. And I moved into this house all excited. You know, I'm a missionary. I'm a missionary. And people would come through. I went to Tennessee Temple, and people would come through school. These missionaries would come through when I was in Bible college. And they're always, they always had rat stories and snake stories and spiders. And I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to do that. I'm going, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have all that stuff just like all these other missionaries. And I got into that house, and I was just so, so excited. I am a missionary. Well, it had openings up here, but the screen was all torn out. So, you know, there were no windows, but and the screens were all torn out, so there's no way you could keep stuff out. And uh, I borrowed a rat trap. Now, not a, you, you, that, that's a little mouse trap. A rat trap's about this big, a big rat trap. I borrowed that from one of the other missionaries. And one night, I caught seven rats. I didn't even scratch the surface. I could just, i get my flash out, I could just see them coming right through, coming through the window, just coming through like a parade. And I, and I looked up one time and there was like a, 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 a thing there to hang clothes in, and one was sitting right up on top of that thing looking at my bed like that, looks like it'd be a good place to leap off to. And I was, and I got so excited. I was writing letters home and said, you won't believe it, I've got rats as big as elephants over here. I was so excited. Missionaries have rats, right? I have rats, I'm a missionary. <coughs> I'd been there a couple of days and I looked up on the wall of the biggest spider I'd ever seen in my life. Man, I thought, you can't get much more missionary than that. That huge spider. And I took a picture, and I can't find that picture anywhere, but anyway, I took a picture of it. Then I thought I should swat the thing. I really should get rid of that big spider. Well, I went over, and when I started to swat the thing, he jumped right at me. Well, I did have a little, little, little panic attack over that one. But after I got over that panic attack, I got so excited. Man, I have spiders. Not only do I have spiders, I have attack spiders. <laughs> I am a missionary. I am a missionary. And of course, we had all the little geckos that were running around everywhere and all the other little animals. But I was just so excited. I am a missionary. Ladies, that was 61 years ago. I'm still excited. Just still excited that God gave me the awesome privilege of being a missionary and going over there and serving him and I got there, you know, back <clears throat> nowadays when they go to the field, they go on a survey trip and they figure out where they're going, who they're going to see. And they, they, well, back when I went, we just went. Okay, here I am. What do I do? And they said, you're going to live at Coconut with Marge Smith. I didn't know who Marge Smith was, and I didn't know where Coconut was. And, uh, but that's the way we did it back then. We just, they just told you where you're going. You just went and you just did it. And. And two, I'd, I went to stay. I went to be a missionary, and to me that was going to be my life. I was going to be a missionary. And I got to stay there for over 40 years. And I'm just so amazed <clears throat> that God allowed me that privilege of not just going. And Indonesia took this country over from Holland. I was the first missionary under the Indonesian government. And if you know anything about Indonesia, you know it's the largest Muslim country in the world. But the island where I was was uh, what used to be Dutch New Guinea, and now it's called Papua Indonesia. The other end of that island is Papua New Guinea. A lot of missionaries over there, but on my end of the island, not too many. But the Indonesian government had taken it over from Holland. And uh, so I got there under the, under the Indonesian government. But we just, uh, we just 
went and here we are now. Let's, let's we'll go there and we'll go tell people about Jesus. So I got down to my station and I discovered again that I could, they're speaking the tribal language. They weren't speaking Indonesian. So I got there and here we are again. I can't tell them anything. Not only that, I didn't have any books to study. Because you know, the Indonesian language, we had books and, and there were, what I had was lessons that they had prepared for people who worked for the State Department. And we always chuckled about those lessons. So I got those lessons. We didn't have language school then. Later we got language school, but we didn't have language school. So I've got to, I, I learned it from those lessons. And remember, I'm in the jungle. Here I'm in the jungle studying the language and I'm studying from these State Department lessons for, for ambassadors and people from State Department who's working over in the embassy way over in Jakarta, which is like from here to California from where I was and, and the capital. Some of the lessons would, I had to learn was, Dimada Bioscope Rex, where's the movie theater? Jambrapa Kreta Yang Brikut Brankat, what time does the next train leave? I'm in the jungle. Yeah, sure, that's all I need to know is when the train's <laughs> gonna leave. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, be I began learning, I, I did study the Indonesian language and found out that it's uh, actually a very fairly simple language compared to the tribal language. But I got down to, uh, to uh, Singo, <coughs> and it's a different language. It's a tribal language. There were no books. The people had never seen a pencil. They didn't have paper. And uh, I'm supposed to figure out how to learn their language. Well, I had taken the uh, Wycliffe, Bible Tran Wycliffe Bible Translators course, but I took it because the mission said I had to, because of all the, so many languages there that were still unwritten. They said we had to learn that just so we could uh, learn the new languages. And I didn't want to do it when they asked me to do it, when they told me to do it. Because you see, I, my life was getting away from me. I mean, I wanted to get to the field. Now I had to go to Canada school one summer, and I had to go to linguistics training the next summer, so I got that whole year in there, just chopping at the bits, wanting to go to the field, and I thought my life was gonna be gone <laughs> and before I get to the field. But I did it, and when I got there, I discovered that was a good thing I did. Because I was there, there was no written language, and nobody ever learned their language, and my job then was to reduce their language to writing, I had to make the alphabet, I had to figure out the grammar, write the grammar book, the dictionary. And of course, the goal for all that was Bible translation. Now, I started that way back, way back. I went to the field in 1964. But I started on the, on the Chituk language. I, I was in another tribe for 10 years and then moved. But I was in the Chituk language, went there in 1974. and began learning that language. Now, before I went to Singo, I was in the in a tribe of the Mimika tribe with a coworker named Marge Smith. And well, Marge had to come home because of her. She was an only child and both her parents were sick and she had to come home. And I thought, well, she'll be back in two or three months, so I'll just stay here by myself. I stayed there by myself for two years. Now, if you know me and know how well I like to talk, you know what miserable that was. The pilot would come about every six weeks and bring mail and as supplies and I would talk his ear off. I'd beg him to stay for dinner. No matter what time of day he came, I begged him to stay for dinner and talk his ears off. Well, after two years of that, the mission decided that I couldn't do it anymore, so they told me I had to move. Well, I felt like it was a failure. I'm being told that I can't do this. I, I, it was a very difficult ministry. The people were unresponsive. They had the Catholic influence for years. They did not want to change. And so that was really hard ministry to work with them besides being alone. But you know, I'm stubborn. I was gonna stay there forever. And uh, well, they told me I'd have to leave and I went to Singo and after a couple of weeks at Singo, a team of horses couldn't have taken me back to Ahmad or so. See, the Lord has to push me into what he wants me to do sometimes. He didn't just tell me he has to push me into it. And he pushed me into that one. <coughs> and we had just opened the ministry there. Actually, it had been opened in the mid-50s. A missionary by the name of Jack Manley went over in the mid-50s, and the people were naked. They were practicing head hunting, cannibalism, and the village was right down on a river, 
And every time the rainy season came, the place flooded. Now, how would you like to have three or four children and crocodiles up under your house? Can come right in when they want to. Well, they weren't, weren't there very long until Annette just had a breakdown and they had to come out. They were just there several months. So the ministry was closed. It was opened and closed within just a few months' time. And uh, so then we went back to reopen it in the mid-70s, 20 years later. And that's when I they were in 74, and I went there in 75. And, uh, but I got there, and I was pretty discouraged. You know, I was, uh, I was being told I couldn't stay at Amara. I've got to, I've got to move. And I was, pretty, I was pretty low emotionally, and I got there. There was no house for me to live in, so they put me in this building. It was not a house. It was a building. It was one long building with four rooms. It had a bedroom, a living room, a kitchen, and a study. You didn't hear a bathroom, did you? No. It was a path out back. Well, I was uh, working really hard, and that was before the days of computers. Now, this thing didn't have windows. It had, it had the openings. It had screens on them. It was the tropics, so you don't get cold, so you don't have to have windows. And my study was all the way at the end, and so it had windows on three walls. It was really nice, you know, because it was it had the most air in there. But one night, I, I had been working so hard, and I didn't have a computer. That's where you put everything by, or do it by handwrite, and had all these little things laid up on, that, on the table <coughs> that I was working on. And I was making some progress. So I was beginning to get my confidence back. I'm beginning to feel pretty good. And one night we had a big rainstorm. Rain, wind was blowing and the rain was whipping around every direction. Pardon me, I'm gonna have a slug of this water. <laughs> that rain was coming around every direction. So I got up, <coughs> no electricity, so I got my flashlight. Come into the living room and I moved everything into the middle of the room. So <coughs> Sorry about this. Tickle. I got to the kitchen. It had blown the, the do door open, but that was no problem because it's got big cracks in the floor. Just wash my floors. But I got to the study, and there was all of my work destroyed. I mean, have you ever been angry at God? Anybody ever been angry at God? If you're willing to admit it. <laughs> well, I wasn't angry. I was plumb mad. I was mad. I was mad at God. And I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do with all this. And I was crying. And I said, Lord, I did all of this for you, and you don't even care. I came all the way over here, and I did this for you, and you're not paying any of attention. You told me you'd never leave me and never forsake me, and you did so. You said you'd be with me to the end of the earth, and you didn't do it. And I told him, you put me here in the middle of this jungle, and you don't even remember where you put me. And I was really upset. And I'm gathering everything up and <clears throat> put it on the floor, under the table. The only place I could put it to get it out of the, out of the rain. And I was just crying and telling the Lord why, you know, just really telling him off. I was really upset with God. And I went back to bed and I pulled the sheet up over my head and I was crying under my pillow. A big puff of wind came through and something hit me on the head. I said, that's it. That's the last straw. That's it. So I got my flashlight to see what it was. I had this little plaque by this big hanging over the bed and it said, he cares for you. <laughs> I began to giggle through my tears. Okay, Lord, I get the point. You know, some people God speaks to in a still small voice. Some of us he has to conk on the head. <clears throat> but ladies, I want to tell you what, I would, I, I am, I, I'm, not proud of all of, of being so upset and angry at God, but I learned some very important, valuable lessons that day. He's a big God, and he can take anything we dish out. Have you ever just had, had these feelings of, of God, you're not paying attention, you don't care, but you, you don't want to voice it? He already knows it. He knows what you're thinking. You may as well just tell him. Just, just pour it out to him. And he's a big guy, and he can take it. And he'll find a way to get through to you. He may have to hit you on the head, but he might find a more gentle way to, to get through to you. But he will. And God was so good, you know, and I 
got up the next day and started back to work and been redoing the stuff that I had lost. But I worked so hard in getting that language. It was a very difficult language. It was considered the most complicated language on the island, and I had to pick the most complicated one. But I fell in love with the people right away, and I could hardly wait to learn their language and to be able to start telling them about Jesus, you know. And, and people say, well, how in the world do you learn a language that's never been written? I says, you have to be willing to make a fool out of yourself, and I was good at that. <laughs> you can't talk, so you act things out, and I hope they say in what you think they're saying, but sometimes they're not. Like when you learn not to do. If I were to do that, what would you say? Stop. Stop. See, you could say, he could say stop, he could say five, he could say hand, or he could say fingers. So that's not a, very, very, not a good one to use. You try to use something that's only going to be one interpretation of it. And some of those things you learn the hard way. By thinking he said something, found out later, that's not what he said at all. And you have to act it out. You, know, you sit down, you stand up, you eat a banana, you give him a banana, and all these sort of things, trying to figure out how to do it. And I was learning the language, and I, I got where I could uh, kind of communicate a little bit with the with, uh, Ogden, who was working with me. And every afternoon, I'd go down in the village, and I'd sit around with the women, and talk with the, talk with them. I didn't do much talking because I didn't know I, I couldn't talk yet. And uh, I had a little notebook, and everything they'd say, I'd write it down. Then I'd come back and say, Ogden, what they say? I don't know what they said. <clears throat> but one afternoon, I went down in the village and. They told me something, and I wrote it in my book, and I said it back to them, and they laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed. I thought, what did I do wrong? So I'd look at it, I'd say it again, and laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh. Then they'd give me another word, same thing. All afternoon, they'd give me words, and then I would say them back to them, and I'd say them back to them over and over and over again. The more I said them, the harder they laughed. And I thought, what am I doing? I'm doing something terrible wrong. Next morning, I got in Ogden, Tell me what these words mean and what I'm doing wrong. So I said one of the words and his eyes got big. <laughs> they had been telling me dirty words all day long. <coughs> and I had, been re I had been repeating them back to them. Well, that really worked out pretty good because when they'd get in a fight, they get in a fight right out in the middle of the village. You never heard such language they would use to, to yell at each other. And I knew what they were saying. I had learned all those dirty words. <laughs> but they, uh, they love to tease. And Ruth, one of our coworkers, she was trying to learn some of the <coughs> she took language. And <coughs> we went down to the village one day, and they were used to me get, writing it in my book. Well, Peb Otter, my good friend, uh, Ruth was trying to get this said right, and she couldn't do it right. And I told Peb, Peb Otter, says, tell her to write it in her book. I said, well, she's got it in her book, and she's got it in her head. She can't make it come out of her mouth right. Well, about that time, Pim Mother's little boy came in, and he looked at Ruth, and what's she doing? Keep, what's she doing? And her mama says, she's got it in her head. No, he said, tell her to write it in her book. <laughs> Pim Mother says, it's written in her book, and it's in her head. She can't make it come out of her mouth right. He looked at Ruth, and he said, what's the matter with her mouth hole? <laughs> so we, we laughed about that a lot, said, oh, I've got a problem with my mouth hole. That bird won't come out right. But, Learning the language was fascinating and it was fun trying to figure out how to communicate with them. And I would tell them, okay, I'm going to have a literacy class. And uh, I uh, told everybody to come, I'm going to teach literacy. I'm going to teach them how to read. And had these little primers, you know, to teach them how to read. Well, a bunch of these ladies came, they came. Well, that afternoon, Pem Mater was my good friend. If somebody says, your friend is sick, I knew it was Pem Mater. They just referred to her as my friend because we had become such good friends. Somebody came and says, Pema, Turbis beat up your friend. Turbis was the village witch doctor, the most powerful witch doctor. Everybody was afraid of Turbis. And his wife was my good friend. And she came to my literacy class. And apparently it made him mad just because she had a book and couldn't read it. So he beat her up with a stick of firewood. So they came and told me that Pem Mater, that, that Twitter Beast beat her up with a stick of firewood. Oh boy, I'm going to have to go down and face Twitter Beast. So I got prayed up and started out, and all the people were standing around. They said, are you going to talk to Twitter Beast? And I said, mm-hmm. 
<laughs> I don't want to talk to the bees. So I went in, and he was sitting there on the floor. They, they, they just don't have any furniture, but their fire. They just put dirt on the floor and put the fire on it. He was sitting there fixing some food. And the pet bottle was sitting over there. And I said, Tudor Breeze, I feel really bad because pet bottle's my good friend and, and, and you beat her up because she came to my class and I feel bad about it. And I kept talking and talking. He just pretended I wasn't there. Just kept doing what he was doing. So I thought, well, he's not gonna talk to me. So I checked out uh, Pam Mata, he had almost broken her arm. He had hit it real hard with a stick of firewood. And so I went over and checked her out a little bit and talked with her a little bit. And I got up to leave. And I stood up and started to walk out the door. And Tudor B says, Nona, that's what they called me was Nona, Nona. He handed me some of his food. Fortunately, I knew their culture. If, if you offend somebody and you want to apologize, you offer them food. If they take it, that means they've accepted your apology. If they refuse it, that means that they might go accept your apology. So he had him with some food. So I turned around, came back in, sat down, and ate the food. And he says, I'm sorry I beat my wife. <laughs> I think, apologize to her, she's the one you beat. <laughs> he apologized to me because he beat his wife. And that was Tudor Beast, most powerful witch doctor at Singo. And while I went out the door, People were saying, did you eat sago with tutor bees? Oh, yeah, no problem. <laughs> yeah, I ate sago with tutor bees. Well, Pam Otter was one of the first converts. Tutor bees eventually got saved. And uh, I went back, I came home to retire in 2004. I think it was 2006, or well, this was 2008. I went back for a visit. Pam Otter had already died. She died before I came home. And tutor bees, he was sick and he came up to, I was getting off the airplane and now we're in the middle of the jungle. We have to just a dirt airstrip, no roads, and a little dirt, little plane brings you in and then you don't go anywhere. You're in the middle of the jungle, don't go anywhere. And I was, <coughs> started back to the house. Tudor Beast came up from the village <coughs> and he met me here. And he said he wasn't feeling well and he didn't feel like coming down to the airstrip. I said, that's okay, when I get settled, I come see you. So I went down to see him, visited with him a little bit in the file. Early the next morning, Tudor Beast died. And when somebody dies, they, uh, they bury them the same day. So I went down, pardon me. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry about this, but uh, they, uh, they just mourn all day. Thank you. And then they bury them the same day. So you just sit down in the village with them. They're crying and mourning and, and uh, you know, digging the grave out there. And uh, I was sitting down there with them and everybody was mourning. And I was sitting there and I just got so blessed because I got to thinking. I remember when everybody in this village was afraid of Tudor Bees. When he died, there was nobody who had been afraid of Tudor Bees because he had come to know the Lord. Amen. What a joy, what a joy. I'm sorry. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, because he had been saved for several years when he died. But uh, Pam Mutter got saved first, then later Tudor Beast got saved. And so it was really good, that was a, a real blessing to see Tudor Beast come to know the Lord. What a joy it is to serve the Lord. What a thrill he's given me. And, I'll be telling more about it in the uh, next service. We've got, what, about 10 minutes? Does somebody have some questions? Maybe some of the questions will be answered in the next service. <coughs> Which one you want to hear about? Find that snake, and I'm not going back to that house. Y'all find that snake. 
they found it curled up in a shoe. <laughs> and, but, yeah, we all had we all had we had a lot of snake stories about it. My co-worker Gail Vinja, she just lived just across the yard from me, and she was up, she worked in a little clinic up there. And I heard the blood curdling scream. And when that was her her house girl was up there, she was down on her hands and knees washing the floor. So she was going to pull the door back to wash behind it, and she was riding down nose to nose to a snake down there. She came running out of the house, and so we got somebody in and got rid of the snake before Gail even knew she had a snake in her house. But yeah, we have lots of snake stories. Well, the next session I'll be telling you about the most exciting thing that ever happened to me and the most rewarding thing that ever happened. And there's nothing more rewarding, I believe, than, than seeing people come to the Lord. And what a, what a thrill that he's given me. So i just give him just a, a little bit of it. And next service I'll be sharing more with you. Thank you very much, ladies.